How's everyone tonight? Ooh, ah! Ooh, ah! Ooh, ah! Ooh, ah! Hello, children. There you go. Hello. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm working on Melbourne Music's Facebook Live, the first show for the next three years. I thought tonight was going to be my last one. Hello, camera two. Because what was going on, I actually thought that um, um, tonight was going to be my last show for Melbourne Musos uh, on beloved Channel 31 and Australian Community TV. And then I realised that um, it was going to be, uh, the Antenna Awards was going to be uh, uh, done remotely next Wednesday, which was going to be my show. So I thought, I've been bumped. On the last thing, my penultimate show, the second last one, became my last. But now, thanks to you, you, and you up there, and everybody else, we saved it. We've got three more years, okay. I don't even know why it, it's three more years. We should have uh, 300 more years because, I mean, have a look at us. You know, Sydney's in lockdown now, come on. They should have their community channel. They used to. Hey, ho, ho. Ooh, I wrote a piece of music today. Uh, I'm going to whip it out later on for you uh, about today's shenanigans up north. But tonight, oh, I actually threw out all my notes because <laughs> they were going to be <coughs> lock and load. <coughs> but I'm happy. Ah, oh, it's good. It's all fine. I had a little slab of honey in celebration the other night. I've gone, my God. I found out halfway through a lesson. I was doing it all online. And uh, then it bobbed up. The email came through. Uh, you know, the producers, Channel 31. And it was like, three more years. And I've gone, ha, ha, ha. Oh, yeah. Happy days are here again, a banner and a banner. Hey! <laughs> All right, enough of that. Let's get into the show. Okay, I want to do quite a tight one tonight. Okay, I usually ramble on for about 50 minutes, but I'm going to do the 25 minute half hour for uh, our dear channel. And uh, what it is, is tonight. Um, is about melodic drums. Last week I was talking a lot about um, the survivors of the Black Page. No, I did it at Christmas. I told you that last week. And what it was was uh, the survivors of the Black Page I was talking about. Uh, Terry Bozio, that was the Black Page, was written for him by Frank Zappa in 1977, and, uh, or at the very least released in 1977. Talked about that last week. And then it, uh, the uh, hat was passed on to Vinnie Colaiuta, and, um, and then on to Chad Wackerman. There was a, another chap by the name of David Logerman, who was on the You Are What You Is album, but he doesn't get much of a mention. Um, sadly, he sounded like a great drummer. I think he just had to get in there and in between the, the Vinnies and the Chads sort of thing. So there you go. But anyway, good luck to him. There you go. But what it is, this is the thing. Uh, something bobbed up through the week. Um, my mate up in Sydney, I hope you're doing okay, mate. You've got the lockdown now. And uh, what it is is... Um, uh, the perennial question came up about um, Terry Bozio's drum kit, which is humongous. There it is up there. Ugh. 
behind me, and uh, it's huge, I tell you. And every time it gets put up, um, we Zappa aficionados have to defend it. What do you need all that for, my nose? You know, big drum kit, small pee pee. <laughs> hey, okay. <laughs> Let's go up. <laughs> okay, but what happens is that when you look at the drum kit uh, and then you take a, a rear view of it, there are notes written on every drum, every single one, mate, and there you go. Now, what goes on when you have a movable feast, such as uh, a band that Frank Zappa would have, uh, and other people like Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull, where you might have had a few drummers go through the band. My favourite is Barry Morballo. My God, I love him so much. You know that already. I don't know why I'm talking like this. Anyway, there you go. But what happens is you have to emulate what came before. So if there's pieces of written out music, those beautiful little black dots and all of this business... There it is there. I love that sound. Anyway, uh, but what goes on is that you have to emulate it. So what would happen? People like Frank Zappa and stuff like that actually, well, I've got this in the warehouse, you know, use that. I did that once for a band called Double Standards. Uh, there were sounds in my head. The keyboard player was a great keyboard player, but, you know, starving musician kind of deal. So I bought him the damn thing. It was a Korg Poly 64. Who remembers them? Oh, had the helicopter sound from Apocalypse Now on it. That was huge in the day, 1982. The film was out in, what, 79? So, yeah. <laughs> well, use that. And what I do, I learned this from Frank Zappa. Um... You'd write your score out, you'd write your chart out to the drummer. Ah, uh, keyboard player. The drummer, I wrote the charts out for him. And what I'd do is also write in, I'd actually sit there and program the, the thing, and then I'd put in the patch. At 64 patches, that's what it's called, the Poly 64. And uh, what happens? You just press the patch and. And uh, there's the sound every time, you know, like that sort of stuff. And there you have it. So, you know, beautiful, and it sort of works. So it works from what comes before. So put it this way. If I, what I did before, that's just like timpani in an orchestra. You know, you would tune your timpani to what Beethoven wanted or, Dmitry Shostakovich or Igor Stravinsky. I thought it was Igor. No, it's Igor. My father, my grandfather worked for your grandfather. Really? The rates have gone up. Young Frankenstein, 1974. So what happens is when you're dealing, when you're dealing with uh, being in a band that perhaps has a few albums out. There's going to be an expectation that you're going to, we're going to, you're, not, you're going to need to learn the hits, mate. You're going to have to do what the previous drummer did. So uh, that's what you get booked for. Hopefully, you get a chart for it too. There it is, all written out. Oh no, here's a CD. You do all the work. <laughs> there you go. And uh, that's what happens. You see, copy that. You know, really. That? <laughs> Can I put my little two cents in? Can I at least try to stay? Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think all of us is, you know, yeah, I've got to, you know. It, it's sometimes what happens. This is the thing that I sometimes talk about. Possibilities and, and the, the possibilities of getting something, you know, playing something. But once it's locked in, you know, once it's a single or once it's this, you sort of expect it, yep, you've got to play that. 
But there were times when, you, you, like, Frank Zappa would just let, let, <laughs> let the fiend go free. <laughs> the Illinois Anima Bandit. And um, what it is, is uh, and it's that Zappa in New York as well. But uh, what happens is that you would have to emulate what came before. So with the survivors of the Black Page, getting back onto that, you know, uh, you'd have different things like... <laughs> You know, like a nested polyrhythm or something. And each one of the drummers, the main drummers, uh, Terry Bozio, Vinnie Colaiuta, Chad Wackham, would have their sticking. That's what I was talking about last week in a big way. Now, one of the things that bobbed up with uh, Les Rankin again and, uh, and uh, Terry Bozio's humongous kit is the fact that um, if you have the aforementioned Poly 64, the old synthesizer in front of you and stuff, well, you know, a, general, a piano, you know, 88 keys. Now, imagine 88 drums, because what happens is your key is as, you know, not much bigger than a finger and all that. You've got 88 of them. So, oh, beautiful, I've got 88 notes. So if a drummer needed to do that, or if Igor Stravinsky wrote for something like that, you'd have to have 88 drums. How do you do this? Well, you don't. You know, you might split it up between three percussionists up the back of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra or something like that. However, if you're going to get melodic, because that's what Terry Bozier does, he sets up an ostinato, he does a kind of a thing, and then he'll play a melody to it. And it's just like you'd write a song or, or a piece of music. You'd have the A section, the B section, you'd incorporate improvisation, and away you go. And that's beautiful, and that's what happens. But sometimes a man's guts to work with his limitations. Clint Eastwood, Magna Force, <laughs> I say it all the time. So what happens is that what are you going to do if you do just have one drum? which I had for the City of Edmonton Brass Band for so long. And I do love that sound, I don't know why. Uh, but um, what goes on is that uh, when you work with just small things, like if you're just working with a five-piece kit, which is my drum kit that I take to the Alex Theatre, uh, when I do um, Facebook Live there, uh, all this sort of stuff, when I go out to a gig, I just take the five-piece, take Delilah out, that's her name. And uh, uh, what I do is uh, work the dynamics of it, you see. So let me, this is what this is about, dynamics, you see. Now, dynamics is uh, what we're dealing with is essentially the volume control of 1 to 10, you see. So when you're dealing with the aforementioned black page, when you're dealing with things like pieces of music that become melodic, okay, uh, these are the kinds of things that really bring out your drumming. You're not always just going nuts. You know, you're not always you know, uh, going to 11 or anything like that. And what's that, what happens then is that uh, you deal with your dynamics. Now, this is what I generally tend to do with my students. What happens is if you think like one to 10, okay, there's three main levels of volume, okay? Soft, medium, and loud. That's not drums, that's universal, right? That's everything. That's your cabinet, Marshall cabinet, that's everything else. That's the remote for the TV, for the footy, you know, and all that, soft, medium, loud. Now, if we go 1 to 10, what happens is if I just do a general 1 to 10 generally, like... Cooked! And you have that. What happens is that uh, you uh, have three main words, phrases, if you like, and... It's literal, it's just Italian words. Remembering that music is a European language developed since around about the 13th century in the times of Pope Gregory, the corrupt one who would sell sainthoods. Oh, naughty boy. And that's why you have the Gregorian chant. You know, can't you, can't you fat bastards all sing together? Bring out the dead! Bring out the dead! 
I'm not dead. <laughs> you got, and so what happens is you've got piano, which means soft. So you might have, think of it about three. You can have it moderato, where the little uh, ring is, the prima ring there. Five. That's normal. There you go. Then you can have forte, which is about seven. Ooh. There it is. Now, when you add, I mean, the, uh, I'm ahead of myself. The abbreviation for piano is P. The abbreviation for M, uh, moderato, is M. Yeah. And the abbreviation for forte is F. Okay, it's not exactly rocket science, is it? And what happens then is that if you add a second P, so you're doing a PP, it's a little bit softer. A two. If you add a, a third P, so you're having a PPP, it's very, very soft. If you add an extra one, it just adds the word very to the phrase. So it's soft, P, 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 very soft, P, 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 very, very soft. Okay. There you go, you see. And uh, what happens then is that if you go across to forte, which is F, uh, what happens is you do the aforementioned double. F, F means very loud. So that if from seven, you go to eight. Uh, if it's F, 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 it's very, very loud. So it'll be a nine. You know? There you go. And then what happens is that when you're dealing with moderato, which is medium, which is like five, <clears throat> uh, what happens is that... Um, if you wanted to uh, go up or down, you actually go up from the piano. So if you're going uh, uh, moderato, which is five, but what you can do is if you wanted four, you could have uh, uh, MP, okay, mezzo piano, okay. So it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more than soft. So it works like that. So that'd be four. So I want to go. And if you did the same thing with forte, It'd be MF, okay. It's a kid's show. And what, well, not all the time anyway. Uh, but what happens is that when you, when, when you, when the MF wants you to have an MF, um, it's one down from the seven, so it's six, you see. And there you have it, you see. But when you want to go to ten, there. That is S, F, Z, okay? What does that mean? It means it's cooked, mate! Cooked! It actually means F, F, Z is Schwartz Ando. May the Schwartz be with you. And there you are. And that's the one to ten. Now, when you're dealing with this, What you can start to do is use the dynamics when you have your limitations, you see. Because you notice that I'm pretty much doing mostly snare drum tonight, you see. Uh, so what goes on is that if you are... Uh, it's a little bit like serialism, okay, for those of you who might know about that. For those of you who don't, serialism is a classical technique uh, used by uh, Schoen, Ar Arnold Schoenberg and then Alban Berg and um, Anton Webern uh, were his uh, two, um, Schoenberg's two luminaries, you know, he, you know, that kind of thing. And they brought in 20th century music with serial, serial music. Stravinsky uh, did it for a little while there. And, you know, it was all the rage, you know, quite a thing. And uh, there you go. And what serial, serialism is, is where you take the chromatic scale and you mix up the tones and you don't play a note until you've played 
the other rest of the row, if you know what I mean. And that's what goes on. So instead of just you know, chromatic scale, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, or whatever, you might have uh, 7, 2, 3, you know, whatever it is. Materials. Look it up. There you go. There's a little bit of an introduction. And you can do that with anything. Um, you can do it with the dynamics that I just showed you, all sorts of things. And um, one of the most beautiful um, uh, serial pieces is Album Berg's uh, Violin Concerto. Ooh, very nice. Because he really made it tonal. You can make it sound like and all that stuff, but look up that one. Have a bit of a listen. It's great. It's beautiful. It's ethereal in the clouds. Anyway, that's what's going on. So as much as I was talking about uh, melody and last week talking about the survivors of the black page and how to get around the drums. Uh, what I want to do tonight is do the exact opposite of contra. Barry Alshul was a drummer. Um, I've, I've mentioned him on the show before because he's fantastic. Uh, but he was one of those New York loft jazz drummers and all that, you know, the avant-garde, Anthony Braxton and all this. And um, what he would do was get you to get one drum, and he said, okay, I want 50 sounds from it. So you just... Yeah. There you have it, you see. That's what goes on. That's a, I'm really just using this beautiful uh, DW uh, stainless steel 6.5 by 14. And uh, it's very nice with a UV1, Evans UV1 head on it, which um, I do not have any muting. I don't have any uh, moon gel or E-rings on it. It's wide open. And it needs nearly ready to get changed. <laughs> How to for all? Great head. You know, little things like that, you see. But there you are. That's a little something for you there. Now, when you're talking about being melodic, and I'm doing most of my stuff on the snare drum, I usually put them up there, but I actually have them. And what it is, is one of the most beloved snare drum books in the idiom is uh, Portraits in Rhythms by uh, Anthony Cerrone. This is a fantastic book. This is my original one. Uh, just the straight 50 snare drum solos. Wonderful. There they are, sort of thing. I would take books like this and, um, and really just sit down and study them and play them and then play the pieces of music as if I was putting on a record or putting on a CD. Uh, most of you little poppets out there would probably have this version, okay? And uh, what happens is um, uh, this is the study guide one where this, the original was just the 50 solos, away you went. And it wasn't really um, progressive. It didn't go from easy to hard. Um, it got pretty tricky even just from solo two. Look at all the ink that was used for that page there, mate. Oh, little black dots, oh, you've got to love them. And it goes through, and when he gets to solo 50, it's a little bit like the grand finale, you know, brrr, big presses and all that. And there you go. And this uh, wonderful book here, he just kept on going with it, and um, it has the study notes in it, you see. So there's your solo one, and then there's a page of, this is how I did it, you know, that kind of thing. And away you go. 
And um, a lot of you guys and gals out there might know it because you have to, it's listed in the VCE studies. A lot of you poor students, I'm so sorry you have to go through it, through it but um, every now and again you'll get um, uh, people just handing you a photocopy of Solo 27. Here, have this ready by October, you know. And I've been in places, you know, as an examiner uh, in the past where um, not even the teacher could play it. I mean, you give me a break, will you? <laughs> Ooh, controversial. And uh, what happens is, um, yeah, that's a bit sad. Because what happens is the idea of books like this is you play the whole book and you play your favourites from it. You know, you go, oh, I love playing that one, I love doing that. Instead of just, yeah, get it ready, blah, blah, blah. You know, eh. But I'm talking about melodic drums. And that's all just for snare drum. Now, what happens is that um, when we're dealing with uh, melodic drums, I've just talked about using one drum and using dynamics and all this sort of stuff. Um, Anthony Cerrone then went on and uh, wrote this wonderful little thing, Portraits for Multiple Percussion. And what it is is he took his solos that everyone knows and loves, and if you can see it, he actually scored it for that little standing up percussion set. You see that there? Eee. And if you have a close look, um, regular watchers of the show might remember that I had this standing up bass drum over there. So if I did put it back there, which I'm thinking of doing, but then I'd need a hoist to hoist myself into Doris here. I know what I meant. And what happens is, have a look, mate, have a look. I could do it. I haven't got the cowbells. I'm shit out of luck with the cowbells. I'm sorry. And the wood block, mate. But that's what it is. So when I put this piece of music up on my music stand, I can actually play the left side. And there's your, you know, melodic drumming comes from one drum. And that hopefully sort of answers what um, people like uh, Terry Bozio was all about with his kit. He's basically thinking like a pianist, okay, sort of thing. He's actually going, when you watch some of the things, I watched um, what Les put up the other day, and um, he was doing... All that stuff. And it was, I, I go, I learned that one song in, out of a marimba book. <laughs> it was like, that's a sticking thing. Because when you're doing sticking for timpani and stuff like that, you have your inside stick if you're going down. You, and your left hand's your outside stick. And if you're going up, it changes around. Your left hand becomes your inside stick. And the right. So that's how you get around a set of timpani in an orchestra. And so what happens is when you have uh, a drum kit with a number of drums, you use the same... There it is, you see, you get that kind of thing there. I did that last week, though, a little bit. Uh, not in the edited show for Channel 31. It was almost all um, uh, editorial last week. Forgive me, but it worked. You know, like, uh, everything that we did worked. Again, thank you so much for everything you've done. Uh, all your support's beautiful. And all that. So, what happens is that uh, the bit that I cut out, it's all right there on the YouTubes and all that. But um, I actually cut out the bits that I was talking about with that. But go and watch that and then come back to this as conceptual continuity. <laughs> yeah. And what goes on, I'm going to finish off now because I did want to sort of be on time. I'm only going to be 10 minutes over. Um, here's our... Another adventure from our friend Winnie the Pooh and this uh, beautiful little ditty. Once again, uh, hello Ali Lee if you're there because I pinched your book. You're going to throw it out? Oh, I've got, I've got plans for this book. <laughs> and this little ditty that I've completely butchered is, oh, where am I? Ace ID, come on, uh, is uh, given, given. 
that there are still gigs that are getting cancelled because of the uh, restrictions. Sydney's in lockdown, so I'm getting a whole lot of friends from Sydney saying cancel, 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 all this. And then you get the other side. Sold out, sold out. Two people turned up, sold out. The barmaid and the sound guy turned up, sold out. There's, there's gigs I know that they're doing three band nights and stuff, and I'm thinking, I've played, I've done that gig. What happens? Like, I mean, once one band plays, the other, they've got to get out uh, so the other band can come in because they've done their nuts on the density limits. I mean, give me a break, they're that small. I've, you know, this, 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 my studio is a double garage, right? Double garage side studio. Uh, and I've done it up, you know, that kind of thing. And I've played in places thinner and just slightly longer. And if you think about it, I mean, I did my square meterage. I, you know, I can get nine people in, and that's that. And it's about the same as you know, three band night, you know, that kind of thing. Ah, I'm a high horse with that. Okay, thank you for listening, audience. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, this is. Oh, where's all this business here? Where am I going here? Turn this up a little bit. This is Winnie the Pooh's first gig. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, thank you again. And here we go. All right. Gigs are starting. Gigs are starting, cried Tigger. Come on, don't be late. Gigs, asked Winnie the Pooh. What are you talking about? Christopher Robin has a new amp and a new guitar and he's getting ready for gigs. We better get ready too. Oh, Tigger, said Pooh. Gigs are for children, not for fluff and stuffing like us. What do you mean not for us? What do you mean fluff and stuffing? We're bass players and drummers. Not Tigger. Tiggers love to go to gigs. Piglets don't love gigs, said Piglet thoughtfully. At least I don't think we do. You're right, Piglet, said Eeyore. This gigging business. It's cooked, mate. Cooked. Bases and backlines and shared drum kits and whatnot. It's overrated if you ask me. I think it sounds great, cried little Roo. Can I go too? Come along, Roo, said Pooh. We all go see Christopher Robin. Maybe he can tell us more about it. Tigger was the first to bound through Christopher Robin's rehearsal space. Okay, where's the gigs, he asked. It's about 400 miles away, said Christopher Robin. The gigging bus will come tomorrow morning to take me there. 400 miles, asked Piglet, pulling his ear. It's cooked, my cook! It's not here in the Hundred Acre Wood, asked Ticker. If you have to go that far from home, you need a travel permit. <laughs> I'm sure gigs is not a good thing for Piglet, said Piglet. We don't have the brains for it anyway, said Pooh. You'd all like gigs, said Christopher Robin. I'm sure you would. Wait right here a minute. I'll make up a rehearsal room just for us. Imagine! Our very own gigs, said Pooh. I wonder if we're up to it. Can we bounce in gigs, asked Roo. Of course you can, little buddy, said Tigger. Gigs are the bounciest place there is. There's no bouncing in gigs, said Eeyore decisively. None, asked Tigger. Gigs are work. No time for fun, said Eeyore. Not even a little, asked Tigger. His shoulders drooped. Eeyore shook his head knowingly. Oh, said Tigger in a very small voice for Tigger. Maybe Tiggers don't like gigs after all, especially when their door take gigs. He and Piglet were about to tiptoe away when Christopher Robin called out, Time for the gigs to begin! Oh dear, 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 dear said Piglet. Christopher Robin set up his amp and around it he put the chairs just the right size for Pooh and Piglet who were playing drums and bass. 
We always sing a song first, all together to warm up our little vocal cords, said Christopher Robin as they gathered around. One, two, one, two, three, four! This is fun, Piglet, don't you think? Whispered Pooh. Shh, said Piglet. Good morning, they all said. Good morning to you. Lock up for you. It's our first gig. It's a door. Take two. Do you mean we have to pay to play? Yes, said Tigger. And yes, said Eagle. Ah, shit, said Pooh. Well, the first gig can be really hard, said Christopher Robin. But I've met the door bitch and the barmaid, and they're gonna give us um, one little part of a slab of honey as the band rider. There you go. And I have two friends who will turn up as well. Sold out! <laughs> it is friendly to spend your day with your two friends who turn up to your door take, said Piglet. And we learn things with our gigs too, said Christopher Robin. That may be okay for you, said Pooh, but we're nothing but the back line. We're the bass player and the drummer. Do you really think a little gigging will improve us? Sure, said Christopher Robin. You can learn to write uh, your tabs out, and it's fun. Christopher Robin handed out some music paper and crayons. Let's all draw the notes above the little black dots for the songs we're going to play. What does that have to do with our gigs, asked Tigger. Well, the best tabs of the alphabet are the tabs in our own name, said Christopher Robin. When our tabs are finished, we can write our names on them. Okay, as well as the notes. They might be the wrong notes, but they're our notes. Could you, can you tab it out, mate? It's all tabs. Cooked, mate! Cooked! Oh, I missed that one. Pooh chewed the end of his purple crayon. Pooh, he printed slowly. He spelt it out. Pooh, S-H-I-T. Pooh. Very nice, said Christopher Robin. Piglet tried writing his own name out. He wrote it down with his crayon. He spelt it out. K-O-O-K-E-D. He spelt it out. It was really quite complicated. When he read it out, it spelled Cook Mike! Eeyore, who only knew the letter A, wrote A under his picture. Don't know when I've had so much fun, he said proudly. I'll have to tab it out. Where's A? Fifth fret, mate. Fifth fret. Rue made some quotation marks. Put your finger on the fifth fret, mate. you got to do the dabs to get the right note. Tigger made a, made a squiggle and everyone did a fine job. Okay, so what happens now is counting is easy too, said Christopher Robin. I'm going to play in 4-4. Four, four. Here we go. 1-2-4. 1-2-4. 1-2-4. Pooh counted. It was turning into a lovely little prog metal masterpiece, which I think the band wanted to call the Eclipse of the Anal Retentive. Crash! Down went the time signature in the first song. Down went the singing. Down went the ants. And down went the PA and the fallback. Fallback, said Tigger? What the fuck is that? Tigger, said Christopher Robin sternly. Sorry, said Tigger. I said for cook. I said of naughty words. Swear jar for me. All these fallbacks and one, two, threes are fine with the time signature, but what about the fun? What good is a place if you can't even bounce in it? It's true, you can't bounce when your bass player is talking, said Christopher Robin. But my gig has a beer garden, and we get to go outside and have our band rider nearly every day. Okay. A real beer garden, asked Rue. Yes, said Christopher Robin. A real beer garden with slides and swings and everything. I knew Tiggers loved gigs, cried Tigger. But Pooh, whose tummy was beginning to feel a bit rumbly, 
was worried about something else. When are we getting paid, mate? When are we getting paid? I hope you're allowed to have a, a few uh, slabs of honey before the gig, he said. Oh, yes, Christopher Robin. That's why I brought all this along. I mean, you have to get shit-faced before you're set. I'm going to bring a peanut butter and honey slab and a banana and milk, one of those boutique uh, slabs of honey. Mmm, sighed Pooh wisp wistfully. And then Christopher Robin, who knew his friend uh, very well, said, Why don't you do the sound? And his friend said, Yeah, mate, but it's only if it's 250 bucks. So, Chris <laughs> so Christopher Robin set out everything he needed for Winnie the Pooh's first sound check. He set out the bass drum, and the bass drum went boom de boom de boom de boom boom boom. And then the sound guy said, snare. And he went crack, 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 crack. Now do the tom toms. And it went boom, 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 boom. And then the sound guy gave his thumbs up and went off and had his own slab of honey. So then it got to 9 p.m. and everything was set up ready to go except the fold back. That was cooked, mate, cooked. And who asked, how's the fold back? And the sound guy came back saying, it's cooked, mate, cooked. So Christopher Robin told Pooh, it's time to do your first gig, Pooh. Okay, it's nine o'clock, time to do your set. And after Pooh had shit his pants that he never wore anyway, uh, had a little lick of honey, got up and played his first gig. It was a good set with no fold back because the fold back was cooked, mate, cooked. Christopher Robin said, I hope your first set went as well as it could go. Yes, agreed Pooh. Can we gig again tomorrow, please? Yes, please, cried everyone else. We need a gig. Are you gigging, mate? Are you gigging? Of course, said Christopher Robin. We'll pay to play every day as soon as I'm home from the rehearsal room. And they all were cooked happily ever after. The end. Oh, the little poppet had his first gig. Oh, no fallback, mate. What is that anyway? What are those buttons for? Uh, uh, uh. Cook, mate. Cook. Hey. Ah. Oh. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that little ditty of Winnie's Winnie the Pooh's first gig. During the easing of Melbourne restrictions, while Sydney just goes into their own. Oh, Gladys Blink, Gladys Blink. She, uh, her, 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 her. She's in the sink. Okay, there you go. My name's Chris Crinnell. I had so much fun doing that. A little bit sardonic, but that's all right. Okay, all right. Um, I'll have this up as usual tomorrow. And um, what a week, as I usually say, but it went from there to there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving Australian community TV. Even though there's only two channels left, they were successful in you know, nobbling the rest and all that. But uh, that little ditty, I know, ouch. But what it is, is um, places like Australian Community TV have been the greatest supporters of live music forever. You know, they do it live. I, you know, my first eight years of the show was, I nearly sent myself bankrupt with a camera on my shoulder, all, all that. And now I went into the educational side and the sardonic side. Some of you might say the bullshit side, but that's all right. I might change next week. And uh, there you go. But you've got other beautiful shows everywhere where they just come and film you. And there you go. 
What other channel does that? Hey, hey, tell me. No, there you have it. So I'm going to love and leave you. And thank you once again for everything you're doing, your support and everything, even as an idea, as a gift. Community channel, community TV is not free. It's a gift. That's what it is. It's a different way of thinking about it. You can make it be anything you want it to be. And you've got three years. Come up with an idea. Get it on the show. Hey, beautiful. All right, I'm out of here. Hey, all right. Oh, wow. And I'll have this up for you tomorrow. And uh, on Beloved Channel 31 next Wednesday night. Take care. Hey, I'm out of here. Oh.